Before we get started in this episode, I just want to give you a little setup that I broke it up into two parts. The conversation went about an hour, and so I split it in half in order to make it a little more digestible. Now on to the conversation. Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Hello, friend, and welcome back to the conversation. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about fostering intuition, intuitive guidance in your children. But wait, if you don't have children, this still applies to you. Because everything that I'm going to talk about today, you can actually apply to yourself, to foster your intuition, to expand your intuition, to actually not shut down your intuition. Now, this actually comes from one of our listeners. She posted this question in our Facebook group, and I thought it would be the perfect topic for a podcast episode. And so it starts like this from Megan in the UK. Lots of mentions throughout the podcast of how early into childhood you, me, acknowledged your different gifts or were aware of them. What about how to recognize this for your child or signs from your experiences of how you knew for yourself? I'm almost jealous of how many wake up so young and were always awake. It's taken me 40 years to wake up. I've definitely noticed my seven-year-old has had her spiritual connection wide open. So I'm trying to encourage her and her three-year-old sister, looking for tips on how to support them through this. What helped you during your upbringing? What would you have loved more of? I think this is a fantastic question. And I've been thinking a lot about it, and there are things that, um, there's a, first, there's a myth that I want to dispel that I was aware, or consciously aware, as a child. I wasn't really aware that I had, or was in touch with my intuition. I only knew that, in hindsight, in my young adulthood, in the 20s and 30s, looking back, oh, I was divinely guided, and I followed my intuition, although... There was much that happened in my childhood that actually shut down or made less available my intuitive guidance than I could have relied on. When I looked back on my early childhood, I recognized, oh, that was intuition and play. But when I was in it, it just felt like I was thinking. It just felt like I was you know, taking the next step. And on a basic level, that's exactly what intuition is. Do you turn right? Do you turn left? Move forward? Go back? How do you feel about this? Is this an expansive feeling? Is it a contracting feeling? I didn't actually know to ask those questions until I was in my 30s. I wasn't trained to actually tune into my my feelings, my vibes, in order to ascertain whether or not something was a good decision. Although my mom did frequently check in with me, Do you like this? Do you enjoy this? Is this fun for you? Whether it be sports, band, basketball, you know, basketball is sports that's somewhat redundant, but other projects. She would always ask me if I got anything out of it, if I was enjoying myself. And that was a key question in really putting me or keeping me involved in the things that were really part of my path. And then my father He was not very directive or wasn't overly directed, I think that's the point, was not overly directed on how I create my life. He had definite ideas about the things he did not want me doing. And uh, one of those was he didn't want me to work at General Motors, work in the plant on the assembly line, which is what a lot of people did in where I grew up. That was their main goal in life. Get a job at, at General Motors, get on the assembly line. Because it was a perfect place for for people that were not educated to get in there and actually make a really good living and continue to make a good living over time. But he, I don't know if he recognized, well, he, he didn't actually foster any of us kids to do that. I was the oldest of five. But he didn't want any of us to work in the plant because it, it kind of sucks the life out of you. There's a certain dynamic that's hot, it's ongoing, there's... It's it's just a different mentality, let's say that. But even my college education wasn't overly directed. It could have been, but it wasn't. 
there was some guidance I wish I would have had, but there's guidance that I didn't have, and that was good. I went to college for a year, year and a half, and then I took three, four years off because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And the direction that I wanted to go in to be a teacher, I was a little dissuaded from that because of the poor pay that teachers had ahead of them. And that was a time when a lot of teachers made $20,000 a year, and that was considered good. But that's also minimum wage was, you know, $2.05. But the the real value in, the, I guess, in for our discussion here today, in me taking a break, I was able to assess for myself what I wanted out of my education, not what other people expected from me, what not what society wanted from me. And so when I went back, I was to I was able to really invest myself in my education, and I studied. Communication. I studied psychology. I studied the things that were really interesting to me, and it was no wonder that I did well scholastically. But I didn't go back to school until I was 22, and that's an age where a lot of people are getting done with their college degree. And I was just, you know, really wading into it and getting started from my perspective, because before that, I took care of a lot of general studies, you know, things that they required you to get. And I was able to really focus on the subject matters that were really interesting to me. But again, I didn't know I was following my intuition. I was just following my gut. And I had talked about it before that I had actually shut down access dissociated from my feelings in a large way. I essentially had two ways of feeling. I either felt really good or okay. I never felt bad. I never acknowledged that I felt bad. And had I, I probably would not have, I guess, involved myself or been a party to things that were less than uh, amazing for me. I would not have tolerated many situations that I put myself in. Not that they were all that terrible. It's just they weren't very inspiring. They were detours to my life. They weren't necessarily in alignment for my greater good. Or, Or let me rephrase that. They weren't the first choice for the universe for me. Because ultimately, we're guided to make any choice we want, and the universe supports us in any choice we choose, and then tries to create a map from where we are to where we ultimately want to end up. So we can, even though it seems like a detour at the time, it's not really a detour. It's just a longer path. So some things that happened to kind of shut my intuition down, that got in the way, that created blocks is I wasn't consulted on my feelings after, you know, junior high, early high school years is when my my mother, my mother, my mother stopped asking me those questions because she just kind of assumed that I knew my way. And for the most part, I guess I did. But being the oldest of five and no longer being talked to, no longer having those conversations in the in that same way, I was kind of left to my own devices. And in that regard, I felt, and I didn't realize this at the time, I didn't realize it until I was in my late 20s, that I felt abandoned in some way. Oh, I just, I I just felt that in my throat. My my body responded. I felt abandoned. I felt um, like I was no longer as valued as part of the family structure, even though I was, even though I was, I, that was my perception at the time. And again, most of this stuff in our childhood is merely perceptions. We have a limited point of view and we're, we're interpreting things totally from our own personal vantage point. But what resulted from that, on one hand, is a strength. On another hand, is a, um, a detriment, is that I considered myself a loner, that I'll just do it alone. No one really understands me. No one will really understand my point of view. No one really cares. And so I became very self-reliant, very independent, and to the point where you I, don't tell me what I should do. You can encourage me, you can ask me, but if you start telling me what to do, I start to be a polarity responder. And my wife has found that out. But, of course, I attracted someone that has the same point of view. She does not like to be told what to do either. Frankly, I don't think anybody does. The other thing that happened in our family dynamic And this was not necessarily by design, but it was just 
because of the economy of being in a larger family structure, my mother, my parents did not have the the bandwidth, the the wherewithal to listen to six different points of view. And so from a, a matter of economy and expediency, my opinion didn't matter very much. It wasn't even really on the table for discussion. Do as I say, do it now, no back talk, and if you need any instructions, go back to number one, do as I say. And so for me, there was very little allowance for any input about my life as things went from day to day in the house or what we did on vacation or what we did here or there. My opinion didn't matter very much. I was to stay with the group and go along with the program. And I know for a fact that shut down me inquiring or following my intuition because I was supposed to play by the rules, do what was expected of me. Now, that might sound horrible on one hand, but what it really did, it set me up for my life path. If you think that we're put into these family dynamics for a purpose, for our greater good, when I began asking, what's my ultimate lesson here? It's been to find my voice. It's been for me to speak up. It's been for me to be self-expressed. That's the big goal for my life. So if that's shut down early on, if that's not fostered early on, then those are choices that I need to make for myself. Definitive, conscious choices for my life. And for me, this is actually, I haven't said it yet, but what I'm going to say next is is what I feel is part of our spiritual path. What's necessary for all of us is to take what is unconscious in our experience and bring it into consciousness so we can make a conscious choice about it. I hope that made sense because it sounded a little convoluted when I said it. Essentially, what is ever unconscious, any behavior, any belief, anything is there underneath imparting or playing into our behavior today, we need to bring that from the unconscious into consciousness so we can choose it. I, I typically say that that we don't reach maturity, we don't reach adulthood until we make choices independent of our upbringing, independent of our programming. Now, it's not to say that our programming wasn't good at some on some level. It's making sure that you're making choices that aren't out of a knee-jerk habitual response you learned as a kid. For instance, my dad wanted me to be a public speaker. For instance, my dad wanted me to learn how to sell. He wanted me to learn how to be conversant with people, to be able to work with people. Now, all that's good. If I did it just because my dad said so, then I would be living out of my childhood programming. But I've made definite choices. Those were good directions for me. I made choices, and it wasn't like that path naturally unfolded for me. I had to make choices to be a public speaker, to get out there. To I went back to school for communication. When at the time when I went to Michigan State, it was known for its communication program. But what I found being in there, that their view of communication is a, is a model. It's devoid of psychological input. And for me, psychology or how people run their brain the beliefs and structures that they have going on in their head, it's how they communicate. It cannot not come out. And so the big thing for me in college was not what I learned, but what I knew I couldn't learn from being in college. I knew this because in the communication department, the feedback that I got is that your point of view is more aligned with psychology. You should think about focusing there. And in the the psychology department, it said your views are more aligned with the communications department. You should focus there. I was somewhere in between. I have married the two. Now, this whole story about my college and me taking a break and, you know, making choices for my life, that's to say that, you know, you can have the best of intentions as an adult. Your parents had the best of intentions for you, maybe, more than likely, You may not have perceived them that way, but ultimately your path as an adult in adulthood is to choose your path regardless of what went on in your childhood. 
you're going to have the path you have, and no one's to blame. It's just a matter of fact. It is what it is. I think a lot of us are under the mistaken idea that we were supposed to be provided with everything we needed from our childhood. It just ain't so. Our parents were flawed. They had their own issues to work with. They were novice, you know, mind programmers. They were parents. No, no rule book, no guidebook, nothing to model. You know, they typically modeled how they were brought up and hope to God, cross your fingers. That was well worked out. In my dad's respect, he did everything, a lot of the things opposite of what his dad did. But, you know, they did the best they could. And so you're stuck with what is, is the way it is. What's that mean? How's you, how do you empower that? Or how do you take that and l- allow it to empower you? Well, if you knew you grew up in a family dynamic that wasn't really big on communication, in fact, they didn't communicate very well at all, you now know that that's your goal when being an adult, that you're to learn how to communicate. You don't say, well, I don't communicate because I was never taught to communicate. My parents never communicated to me. They were horrible at communicating each other. We never talked things out. It was always an argument over everything. It was always who could speak louder, who could talk louder. That was the family dynamic I grew up in. Not me, but people have said that. And so your job is to learn to communicate. You're basically under the assumption that you don't know how to communicate. No one ever taught you how to communicate. So your job today is to become an excellent communicator, to overcome the deficit of the past. You don't allow the deficits or the learnings, the lessons you didn't have as a kid and allow those to get in the way or be the excuse for why things aren't in place today. You know, if you didn't have the tools back then, you get the tools, you get the training, and you move on. The only thing it does is it explains some of the decisions, some of the mistakes you made up until now. But now that you're aware of where this comes from, you can repair it, you can investigate it and create new skills and learn new abilities. And and so some of this is about parenthood. Some of this is about childhood. Some of the things that shut down intuition. And just know as a parent, you're going to screw things up. You're not going to get it right. It's going to be up to your kids to really work it out for themselves. But you can do things that won't get in their way. If you have small children If you're the adult child, you can start applying these things to yourself to foster your own intuitive guidance. In my opinion, one of the biggest things that adults do, parents do, teachers do, to not foster intuition is that they make outside validation oh so important to get the right grades, to be a good girl, a good boy, to get the approval of the program to not color outside the lines, to do it right, to do the right thing. I was at the pool a couple days ago, and the lifeguards were on a break. All the kids were supposed to be out of the family pool, and there was a young girl, probably four years old, that was sitting in the shell. She was sitting on, she was not, her parents like were with arm's reach of her. And they were saying, you better get out of the pool. You're not supposed to be in there. You're going to get in trouble. And I said, oh, leave her alone. Let her break some rules. They gave me the dirtiest look. But the little girl gave me the biggest smile. But this idea of not getting in trouble, of coloring inside the lines, of doing the right thing, to be validated by outside sources, that is the greatest detriment to tuning into your intuition. It's the greatest detriment to you having established boundaries, your children having boundaries. Because if they don't do it by the letter of the law, if the letter of the law, if they don't have the instructions, like if they're in a situation, they don't have the instructions, what do they do? What do they do? If no one's there to tell them what to do, they are helpless. And I come across people like that all the time. But okay, so how do we use this for your children? How do we use this for yourself? Well, decide to break some rules, as long as you're willing to pay the price for breaking that rule. What are the consequences? Are you willing to take the consequence? This elevates rule breaking to a whole new level. There's such a thing as 
the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. A lot of laws are put in place in order to save lives, to prevent issues. And you can align with the spirit of the law, but not necessarily the letter of the law. Like for the kid, she was not supposed to go out in the deep end. She's not supposed to be there unattended. Her parents were there. She was attended. That's the spirit of the law. She's not supposed to be in the water at all. That's the letter of the law. The other question, it comes from the philosopher Immanuel Kant. And it's a, it's a question you can entertain doing virtually anything on whether or not you should or shouldn't do something. Let's say that you do do something and it becomes the letter of the law, the law of the land, and everyone has the same access to do it. If everybody was doing this act, would you like to live in the world that is now created? For instance, there's rules of the road, there's speed limits, there's, there's actual procedures that you're supposed to do. And I see people passing on the shoulder as if, you know, it's just them, it's just this one time. But if everybody did that, if everybody did that, it would be a colossal mess. From time to time, you'll see people that swerve in and out of traffic. They speed and they, they take shortcuts. They cut people off. If everybody did that, it would be a colossal mess. But people justify it. It's just me. It's just this one time. Or, you know, I, I am in a hurry. Well, time studies, I used to be a driving instructor. Time studies show that breaking the rules speeding in different situations don't get you that much further ahead, maybe, if you're lucky, by a minute or two. Have you ever noticed people that pass you and speed and cut in and out of traffic, you tend to catch up with them in a light or two? They're stopped there and you pull right up next to them, see? You know, and you're thinking in your head, that didn't get you very far. Yet, how many lives did they put in danger? How many lives did they potentially put in danger? When I was younger, I exceeded the speed limit quite often. Uh, but somewhere along the line, I realized, you know, it's fast enough. And how much am I willing to pay if I got a ticket for 8 over, 10 over, 15 over? I'm not saying I did that, but let's say that if I got caught doing that, am I willing to pay the price? Am I willing to pay the consequence? You know, it could be points against your license, little demerits, and it's a heavier fine. The increase in fine between 9 over and 10 over is completely different. And so for myself, just for my own integrity, but the letter of the law is the speed limit. I allow myself to do the speed limit and up to 5 miles over. I'm willing to take the, the fine, the consequence for 5 over. Any more than that is just not worth it to me. But I remember a guy one time that said, you know, anybody that speeds or exceeds the speed limit, I know that I can't trust them to do anything. Because if they'll do it in that circumstance, they're going to break the rules somewhere else. To him, it was a matter of integrity. He lived by the letter of the law. I don't think he was very in touch with his intuition. So prescription number one is allow your children to break the rules from time to time. But as long as they're aware of the consequences of their, or the potential consequences, is it really going to make a difference? And then if everyone was allowed to do it, would it be a world that they would want to live in? Prescription number two, and these are really in alignment with going by inner validation, trusting your own vibes. Have your children do a vibe check. When they're about to do something or engage in something, do you want to go here? you want to go there? Do a vibe check. Have them check in with their vibes. How does it feel? Does it feel, again, there's this, this expansion and contraction idea. Does it feel light? Does it expand? Does it feel good? Or does it feel contracting? Does it feel heavy? Does it feel like, you know, disgusting, something you don't want to do? Have them tune into their vibes. How do they really feel about it? And then honor those feelings. Sometimes people ask me, how does this work with a, a family outing? Let's say I want to take the kids somewhere and one of the kids don't want to go. And they're very adamant, I don't want to go. And so you can give them an option to stay home with childcare. Or 
you can give them the option to negotiate with you. I want you to go because I want us to be part of a family. If you do this for me, what can I do for you to make this enjoyable for you? Many times they just don't want to be bored. Sometimes there's a real intuitive hit they don't want to go. But either way, we want to honor their feelings and we want to give them choice. Always, to the best of your ability, give them a choice in the matter. If you do this for me today, what can I do for you, either on the trip or, and then if they ask for something outlandish, you can say, well, that's not going to work. How about something else? And sometimes you make a rule with, the, with your kids is that everyone has to have fun. Meaning that if we engage in something, I, the parent, has to have fun and the child has to have fun. If neither one of us are having fun, then you need to speak up. And then we can work it out. Maybe we can find a solution. Maybe you just have to bear it for now and you'll have relief afterwards. But at least you're honoring their feelings. You're acknowledging how they feel. And that's very important. This is the end of part one. And I picked up the prescriptions and my explanations on part two. So until next time, this is your friend and host, Daniel Danovi, urging you to follow your bliss. Live your life from inner signals. Be inner directed as you engage in the epic adventure. <laughs>